Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone. Um, so my keynote, I was asked to speak for 20 minutes, so it's a sh short keynote, uh, so that way we'll have lots of time to discuss. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today, I, I didn't have the benefit of going to all the, the panels, but I'm going to be talking about a lot of the themes that were talked about in, at, at the conference. And I'm going to be talking about what I think is one of the most significant challenges facing old democracies uh, in Europe and North America at our current moment. And that challenge is that political establishments are weakening, which has opened the door to illiberal political forces, which may threaten liberal democratic political institutions. So really a great paradox of the time in which we're living, I think, is that illiberal authoritarian forces in old democracies are on the rise because our politics, in a, in a very particular sense, is becoming more rather than less democratic. So I want to elaborate this and talk about some of the dilemmas that come out of this. Now, we all know uh, about the, illiberal, the rise of Ill illiberal political parties, which have begun to attack norms and even some rules of democracy. So Trump, uh, Salvini, Le Pen, the Austrian Freedom Party, the Brexit Party, and of course, the AfD here in Germany. The, the rise of illiberalism has gotten a lot of attention, but the bulk of this attention seems to have focused on the demand side, or why voters are turning to populists and, and illiberal authoritarians. Many scholars, for example, have focused on economic uh, causes. They highlight the failure of established political parties to protect unskilled workers from the effects of globalization, disappearing jobs, stagnating incomes, rising inequality, especially in the wake of the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Other scholars point to the role of race in immigration and culture and how Americans and Europeans are responding to immigration and increasing ethnic diversification. So it's Steve Levitsky and I in our book, How Democracies Die, make an argument along these lines in which we say that the reaction of the previously dominant white Christian majority to increasing diversity and racial equality is what's driving polarization and norm erosion in America and uh, the US today. So a sense of cultures under siege. Now, these standard demand side factors are important, and there's lots of work demonstrating their importance, but they clearly don't tell the whole story. And I, indeed, I think there's really a kind of supply side story uh, to be told. And that supply side story is that it's much easier to be an electoral, ele electorally successful illiberal populist or authoritarian today than it was in the 1950s or 60s. And that is because political establishments are weakening across the globe. Now, what do I mean by political establishment? Well, here's just a, a one kind of rough definition. The political establishment is the collection of organizations and actors that control the resources politicians need to get elected and sustain a career. So just for the sake of simplicity, I'll focus on three types of establishment organizations. One is political parties, which are important to politicians because they control access to candidacy. Another is business labor, and other interest groups, which are critical source of finance and other campaign resources. And third is major media outlets, such as television stations and newspapers, which are the principal means by which politicians gain access to voters. Now, political parties, interest groups, and media, traditional media outlets, obviously do not constitute a single monolithic entity. There's pluralism and competition within all, each of them but they do impose certain boundaries, both in terms of political style and policy substance. Politicians who exceed those boundaries, who violate certain behavioral norms or push extremist policies tend to be shunned by, by the establishment. Party leaders won't nominate them, union leaders won't back them, and mainstream media won't cover them, or at least will be report negatively about them. Now, half a century ago, this mattered a lot because political, the political establishment maintained almost a monopoly over the resources politicians needed to get elected. So in the 50s, 60s, early 70s, party leaders controlled the candidate selection process. There were no primaries in most democracies for selecting candidates or party leaders. A re relatively small number of interest groups provided the bulk of finance and other campaign resources, so business groups, labor unions and a limited number of media outlets dominated the media uh, scene. So the US had three television stations, Britain only had one, Germany had a few. This meant that any politician who was serious about getting elected had to be on good terms with the political establishment. Politicians needed the approval of established, the established party in order to run for office. They needed the approval of major interest groups so they could raise money, and they needed to get the approval of major media outlets so they could get decent coverage. <clears throat> 
This dependence on establishment institutions had important consequences. It meant that politicians couldn't just respond to voters and their preferences. They also had to respond to the establishment. They had to strike a balance, in fact, between appealing to voters on the one hand and appealing to the establishment on another. This had really a restraining effect. It meant basically that only insiders or broadly, broadly pro-establishment politicians could su sustain a successful political career. Now, in some sense, this was not a particularly democratic kind of arrangement, if you think about it, but it was very stable. But it was 20th century Western democracy, a system in which political competition was real but nevertheless constrained by politicians' dependence on the establishment. Politicians who challenged the establishment, the ones we today call populists, usually failed. Now this establishment existed in broad strokes, I would say, in democracies all across the world, Germany, Sweden, the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, but not anymore. Over the last few decades, establishments across the world have been losing their near monopoly over electoral resources, which means they're losing their power for politicians. In many democracies, established parties have lost their monopoly over candidate selection, thanks to internal party democratization. This happened in the United States early in the early 1970s with the introduction of primaries. This happened in Britain, and this has now happened even in the SPD, the, the object of Robert Michel's iron law of oligarchy where activists can directly select the party leader. Interest groups have also lost their monopoly over campaign finance because candidates can raise money on the internet. So Bernie Sanders in the 2016 election, the outsider Bernie Sanders, people sometimes forget this, raised as much money as the consummate insider Hillary Clinton. And of course the emergence of social media has eroded the influence of the established media. So Twitter, Facebook, and other social media allow candidates to reach voters in, in different channels. So my co-author, Steve Levitsky, uh, went to Brazil last year to talk about our book at the beginning of that year in 2018 presidential election. And he met with a bunch of business leaders. And it was, it was very fascinating because the, most of them uh, backed the established center-right candidate, Governor Alckmin. And even though Alckmin was down in the polls, business leaders were convinced that eventually he would win because he was backed by a broad coalition of mainstream parties, which also meant following Brazil's election law this, that he had a huge advantage in TV time. Alkmeen had more than an hour a night of free television coverage. Bolsonaro, the outsider, had very short 10 seconds at some, and, and just very limited television, essentially no television coverage. Nobody talked to uh, uh, Steve about uh, WhatsApp, YouTube. But Bolsonaro used exactly WhatsApp, YouTube, to bypass the TV networks, and he won the election. Politicians today don't need the establishment as much as they used to. They can rely on online funding and on online attention. They can hijack parties through primaries, like Trump did, or they can create their own parties, like the Five Star Movement. For politicians, this is liberating. Freed of their dependence on the establishment, politicians can respond directly to voters without worrying what the elite thinks. In fact, they can campaign against the elite. In the wake of the financial cri crisis, in the context of increasing economic inequality, heightened racial and cultural resentment, there's a fair amount of public demand, of course, for this kind of appeal. But there's always been this kind of appeal uh, in democracies. Millions of Americans sometimes forget, back the anti-Semite founder of Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford, uh, when he considered running for president in the 1920s. Or uh, the, the right-wing radio personality, Father Coughlin, in the 1920s and 1930s. Or uh, the Louisiana authoritarian governor, uh, Huey Long, in the 1930s. And the segregationist uh, governor, George Wallace, in the 1960s. So this has always been there. This demand has always been there. What's new is what's happening on the supply side. It's much easier to bypass the establishment and even oppose the establishment today than it was 50 years ago. So in this new scenario is in a certain way more democratic. Thanks to their newfound independence, politicians can be much more responsive to at least a certain segment of the population. But this also leaves us much more vulnerable to demagogues, many of whom go on to assault democratic institutions. So this is quite a paradox. Remember, Western elites didn't always love democracy. Uh, I wrote a whole book on this uh, in 2017, Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy. Terrified, back in the 18th and 19th century, ter ec economic and political elites were terrified of democracy because they equated it with governance by the great unwashed masses. Western elites really didn't accept it until the late 19th, early 20th centuries. What made democracy acceptable to them 
was in part counter-majoritarian institutions. That's to, that's to be sure what we know today call representative democracy. But the other thing that made Western democracy, modern democracy, safe for elites was the power of the political establishment. For example, hierarchical party organization. 19th and 20th century establishments imposed powerful constraints on democratic competition, transforming what could have been plebiscitary or majoritarian democracy politics into more bounded, elite-centered competition. This gave rise to what we today think of as Schumpeterian democracy, a system essentially of elite competition. The 20th century was a profoundly Schumpeterian era, and Schumpeterian democracy required and depended on a powerful establishment. But those days of Schumpeterian democracy may be coming to an end. The establishment's gatekeeping role has eroded, and this, I think, is having a profound effect on what we see today. It opens the door to demagogues, Trump, Salvini, Bolsonaro, and Hooker. Many who of these figures who then go on to assault liberal democratic institutions. So this creates a dilemma, and I think actually um, Anna laid out the essence of the dilemma beautifully uh, at the first session yesterday. In response, how do you respond to illiberal political forces? You know, maybe rebuilding the establishment is one answer. I'm not going to suggest that, though, today. Because in the meantime, we have to figure out how to deal with Anna's dilemma. And I'll, I'll elaborate the dilemma, because it creates an acute problem. So the dilemma is this. If democratic politicians ban or stigmatize or refuse to talk to illiberal forces, illiberal politicians or illiberalism's advocates, polarization may result, threatening to spiral out of control. And the literature and, and Political science is pretty clear that extreme polarization can lead to democratic decay. On the other hand, if, poli establish if democratic politicians and citizens tolerate illiberalism or collaborate with illiberalism, illiberalism is, is legitimated, empowered. And this too can obviously be lethal to democracy. And this is more than just a theoretical dilemma. In the state of Turingen several weeks ago, the AfD came in second after the left party. And this has unleashed a passionate, heated debate within the CDU itself, the terms of which map exactly onto this dilemma that Anna identified. On the one hand, there are some within the state level Turing and CDU who argue that compromise and coalition with liberalism maybe won't be so bad. Maybe it will tame illiberalism, or maybe at least it will reduce polarization. On the other hand, the national CDU takes the opposite position. Compromise and coalition will legitimate and embolden illiberalism, putting German democracy itself at risk. So how, how, do, how are we supposed to think about this? In my remaining minutes, what I'm going to do, I don't think it turns out we have to reinvent the wheel. We are not the first generation to face this dilemma. There are actually two centuries of thought on this question. And the historical record, in my mind, has given rise, at, at least to, to my mind, five different paradigms. I could talk for two hours about that, but I'm just going to go through them very briefly. Five paradigms. Paradigms, of course, as we all know, um, don't tell us exactly what to do, but they tell us where to look. And so I want to sketch each of them out. So paradigm number one is uh, the classic Millian, or John Stuart Mill paradigm. Facing illiberalism, John Stuart Mill might say, let all opinions compete. Let's have what Mill called the collision of adverse opinions, because it's only in this way that we can find the way to truth. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that John Stuart Mill would suggest the CDU should form a coalition with the AfD, but he would say, don't mobilize public opinion to silence outrageous voices. Don't use the physical force of the state to silence outrageous voices, because outrageous ideas may contain an element of truth that needs to be heard, and because it's only by hearing outrageous ideas that we learn to defeat them. And so out of this, the way out of this dilemma from this perspective is to guarantee the free marketplace of ideas, to let good ideas simply, the space to simply beat out bad ideas. And those with bad ideas, we talked about this in the last session, according to this, you might moderate their ideas when they realize their ideas aren't working. That's paradigm number one. It may not be satisfactory to a lot of us, but it's a coherent view that I think we have to contend with. Paradigm number two is pretty much the opposite view. Paradigm two is the tradition of militant democracy, or in Germany, Wehrhafte Demokratie, Streitbare Demokratie. From this view, it's insane to let illiberal ideas and illiberal tactics, especially on the same platform as people playing by the rules. It will be an uneven, uneven fight because illiberals fight dirty. So the idea of militant democracy is to defend democracy. The state, the coercive apparatus in a top-down fashion, should be used to differentiate acceptable and unacceptable speech, acceptable and unacceptable parties, and after a legal process, 
ultimately to, to be able to ban speech, certain speech, or ban certain parties. So this is another answer. Now this uh, tradition was developed and articulated by uh, German emigre Karl Lowenstein in the 1930s, who was happy to point out that Hans Kelsen, the Weimar theorist who was most closely associated with Millian liberalism, in 1932, the year before Hitler came to power, wrote that if you're truly committed to democratic norms, you must be, as he put it, willing to go down on the sinking ship. To a militant democra a democracy advocate, again, this is insane. Understandably, the militant democracy tradition has had an important role in Germany and informs the Constitution. It was used in the 50s to ban uh, communist and Nazi successor organizations. The current status of this tradition, though, I think is interesting, and I've been following this a bit, is unclear. The German Supreme Court seems ever more unwilling to use this tool. And of course, it has its own critics. Can a self-confident democracy really ban parties? This sounds a little bit too much like the American Vietnam War strategy, you must destroy a village in order to save it. This is exactly the criticism of paradigm three. And then I think this is the most live tradition. Rather than deploying the state to ban parties, paradigm three is, that a par is, the, is essentially the idea that urging us to deploy informal norms to combat illiberalism. Deploy informal norms. So what's this mean exactly? It means don't invite illiberal authoritarians to public meetings like this. It means that when you don't, be, come up, be sure to come up with convincing rationales for why you didn't. Exclude them from panels, from parliamentary committees when you can. And if you can't, expand or shrink the size of parliamentary committees to dilute their impact. Change the rules about how parliamentary committees select their leaders to dilute the impact. In other words, use the, the levers of everyday institutions, parliamentary committees, oversight committees, to isolate and sideline illiberal authoritarians. Use the letter of the law, in effect, to, to the max to exclude them from debate. But it also means that when it comes time to forming governments and cabinets, be willing to form alliances with anybody who's committed to democracy, no matter how awkward the alliance, to make sure that illiberals stay far from power. This strategy of stigmatizing, sanctioning, isolating illiberals, by the way, is the strategy that Steve Levitsky and I urge uh, in our book, How Democracies Die. But I think we're only at the beginning stages after, after today and other work that's being done um, and understanding whether, how, and under what conditions this actually works. I'm probably running out of time, so I'll quickly go through the last two paradigms before closing. Paradigm four is not about elite maneuvering, but instead about inoculating citizens and mass publics against the appeals of demagogues and authoritarians. Paradigm four is one that emphasizes the importance of democratic education. Teach citizens and school children the importance of democratic values. Teach school, uh, t uh, citizens and school children the skills of running meetings, moderating debates, learning to disagree, uh, respectfully. Teach citizens and school children the details of how constitutions work. This is the tradition of civic education. And it's something that although political scientists beginning in the 50s through the 90s really focused on, I think has fallen to the wayside. You know, there's been much more interest in getting the macro institutions right than getting the political skills of citizens right. And I think this is something that when we, there's a panel on this today here as well, this is something that I think I, I would imagine is going to be of increasing interest for everyone. The final and fifth paradigm is one I call a paradigm of social mobilization. Now this is the one I have the least to say, but I think in some ways it may be the most interesting, the most important. So what do I mean by social mobilization? I mean that one answer to the dilemma of coping with illiberalism is to mobilize democratic forces in favor of democracy. This may mean people in the streets, this may mean community organizations, neighborhood meetings, self-organizations of civil society, and this may mean more people voting, encouraging more voter turnout, figuring out how to generate more voter turnout. There's actually a lesson, I think, to be learned for the American civil rights movement here. The American civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s was above all an effort by normal citizens to push against illiberalism within an otherwise mostly democratic political system. This particular form of illiberalism was racial hierarchy and apartheid and single party rule in the US South, but I think there are general lessons from this. One of the most important theorists of the civil rights movement was not Martin Luther King, but rather a man named Bayard Rustin, who organized King's 1963 March on Washington. Rustin knew illiberals and authoritarians don't give up power and don't reshape their agenda unless under duress and under social contention. But Rustin also knew that social mobilization has to be done in conjunction with actors operating within formal political institutions. And so I think there may be a lesson in this as well. 
For example, in East Germany, we have to remember, a majority of East Germans detest the AFD. Combating the appeals of the AFD may not just be a story of elite messaging, banning parties, or turning political elites into pariahs. It's also about grassroots activism in communities, in places like, say, Chemnitz and Saxony, where democratic citizens want to retake their communities. So I'll conclude then with this final thought. We're an age of declining political establishments. The result, though, is that as a, res as a result, we face a series of dilemmas with no easy answers. But I actually think there's a role for all five of these strategies that I've just laid out. And I think actually it's really their combination that constitute and make democracies resilient. Um, so for scholars, there's a lot to study, and practitioners, there's a lot to do. Thank you.